Thank you. I'm Kimberly Reed, and I'll be talking about my PhD work on atmospheric rivers. So what is an atmospheric river? Well, this plot here just shows a snapshot of atmospheric water vapour from satellite observations over the globe. And what we see is there's a lot of water vapour near the tropics, and it decreases as you move towards the poles. But coming off this band of strong water vapour in the tropics are these narrow streamers. And these narrow streamers are what we call atmospheric rivers. And they're responsible for about 90% of moisture transport between the tropics and the equator. A single atmospheric river transports more water than the Amazon River. And there are about five to six of these weather systems on the globe at any one time. Atmospheric rivers provide important rainfall for drought-stricken regions like California but they can also lead to heavy flooding, landslides, and damaging winds. There's one atmospheric river that even has its own name called the Pineapple Express, and that's because it serves as a highway for moisture traveling from tropical Hawaii to the west coast of the USA. We measure atmospheric rivers using a variable called the integrated water vapor transport, which is a measure of horizontal water vapor transport in the atmosphere. IVT is basically the product of moisture concentration and wind which we observe from satellite observations, weather balloons, aeroplanes, and models. So we study atmospheric rivers by taking the moisture concentration times the wind speed at increments, vertical increments, throughout the layer of the atmosphere. Then we add these all up, and this provides an estimate of water vapour transport through the column of the atmosphere. IVT is measured in units of kilograms per metre per second, and we consider an IVT region to be enhanced and therefore an atmospheric river when it exceeds 250 kilograms per metre per second. So during my well-planned out PhD, I was studying these atmospheric rivers when in March of 2021, there was a bunch of extreme rainfall and flooding across most of Australia. Heavy rainfall that lasted more than a week. And you can see the plot on the right showing rainfall totals from weather stations across the country. And those red dots indicate places where there was more than 100 mils in 24 hours. Every state except WA received a warning from the Bureau of Meteorology during this period. And Sydney's Observatory Hill weather station received 110 millimetres in 24 hours, which is about one-sixth of Melbourne's average annual rainfall. So we put all my work aside and decided that we had to study this event because it was generating a lot of media and political and public interest. And people wanted to know whether events like this would be more common in the future under climate change. So we put about, we put about invest, to investigate this event. First, we looked at the integrated water vapour during this event. And so the coloured regions here represent values above 200. And remember I said the values above 250 were considered enhanced. And what we see on the leftmost plot here on the 18th of March is this continuous stream of moisture coming from the Pacific Ocean and that's associated with a blocking high in the Tasman Sea. Then by the 21st we see this weather system developing in the northwest and this is what we'd call a quintessential atmospheric river. You've got that tropical, extra tropical passage of moisture. Then by the 23rd, this atmospheric river hits the already wet east coast and you, we're observing really high IVT values in the sort of 7, 800 kilogram per metre per second range. So we want to try and understand this event in the context of the past. And we did this by looking at daily IVT values for 40 years over Sydney. The y-axis here show the count, so the number of days, and the x-axis show the IVT values. So on a typical day, you'd expect about 100 kilograms per metre per second. But for this event, we observed about 580 at the peak, which is a lot, but it's actually not super intense, as in it's only about the 40th highest event over this 40-year period, which made us scratch our heads because there were some really big impacts, as we observed, but this daily value alone doesn't really explain why those effects were so big. So instead, we want to look at the 10-day mean because we noticed that what was interesting about this event was that it stuck around for a long time. And what we found was that there was the third highest 10-day average IBT period in this 40-year period. So what that means is that although any given day wasn't super intense, we had 10 consecutive high or above average days, and that's why there was 
such, such extensive damage. But of course, people want to know what this means for the future, especially in the context of climate change. Unfortunately, climate scientists can't predict the future. But we can predict a set of possible future outcomes. And using state-of-the-art climate models, we can estimate which outcomes are the most plausible. So a climate model is basically one simulation of planet Earth. And one climate model alone isn't all that useful. That's why scientists typically use multiple climate models to project the future. Because if all the models are saying the same thing, then that gives us confidence in their future projections. In reality, the models are usually saying slightly different things. They give slightly different simulations of planet Earth. And that's okay, because the climate is a chaotic system. That means that small perturbations to the initial conditions can lead to a wide variety of future outcomes. And we test how well climate models might go at predicting the future by seeing how well they predict the past. Some models do a terrible job at predicting the past, so we exclude those. Once we've established which models do a reasonable job at projecting the future, we can start to calculate some interesting variables. So one key metric we use is the probability ratio, and that's the probability of an event occurring in the future divided by the probability of an event occurring now. And a value of one means that the likelihood of the event is about the same. A value greater than one means that the event in the future is a lot more likely than the probability of the event happening now. So keeping all that in mind, here is our major result. So on the y-axis, we have the probability ratio of the 10-day mean IVT that we observed during the March 2021 floods. The probability of that between 2080 to 2100, which is these right boxes here, divided by the probability of the event in 2021. And that's what that dashed line indicates, a value of one. So these boxes indicate the range of the model projections. So that gives us some degree of uncertainty in our results. You'll also note that each of these labels has either SSP245 or SSP585, and that just indicates whether it's a moderate emission scenario or a high emission scenario. But we found that it didn't actually matter if it was moderate or high. We were kind of getting the same result. So the boxes on the left actually indicate the projection of the past, so 2080 to 2014. And we showed that it's about getting that 10-day mean IVT that we observed during March was about 10% less likely a couple of decades ago than in 2021. However, for our future projections, the probability of persistent and intense IVT occurring over Sydney will be about 60% greater than it is now under moderate and strong emission scenarios. So to summarise, atmospheric rivers are giant conduits of enhanced moisture transport in the atmosphere, and we study atmospheric rivers using a variable called the integrated water vapour transport. The New South Wales and Queensland March flooding was associated with persistent and strong integrated water vapour transport. Using climate models, scientists can make projections about the probability of future extreme weather, and we found that the likelihood of similar IVT events over Sydney should increase by approximately 60% by the end of the century. Thank you.